All right, let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Romans. Go to the book of Romans in chapter 8. You know, we've been going through the book of Romans, but even if you have not been here in the past, this isn't like it's going to be uh, confusing or anything like that. It should still make perfect sense as we go through this, this passage here in the book of Romans in chapter 8. We'll first read all these verses and then we'll get into it. Let's start in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. The Bible says this, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Verse 20, For the cre creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into a glorious liberty of the children of God. Verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in the pain together until now. Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, groaning, and which cannot be uttered. Verse 27. In he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his ver purpose. Verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of, the, of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also called. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again we thank you, God. We thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love, God. Lord, I ask that you be with me this morning. Give me the gift of teaching. Lord, help me only to say and remove me that you will be glorified, that you will be praised, Lord. Lord, I ask that you will bind any spirit, any distraction. Lord, I ask that you open hearts and open ears. Lord, that this message will do a work. Lord, because this is the word of the truth of the gospel, Lord. We praise you, we honor you, and we glorify your holy name. Amen. How many of you have ever started reading a book or even watched a movie and had had a bad ending? Anybody? You start watching a movie or you read a book and it seems all right and it seems pretty good and then at the end it, it ruins the whole book. It seems like, man, this was a waste of my time. If I would have known how the story would have ended, I would have even started reading it. I've done that many times. I've started reading a book and I'm like, man, that was really disappointing. When, you know, when the good character dies or something happens or it didn't turn out, you know, very well, or, or something, it's like, man, that really ruins the whole story. Now, I've entitled my message, The Final Outcome. We have a story that will end very, very good. Amen? It won't be a disappointment. It will be a very good ending. Now, before we get into this passage here in Romans, I want you to note a few things. Sometimes when we see the word salvation, we automatically jump to one thing. We think salvation, that means that Christ has saved us and there's no more saving to be done. But that is not true. 
Salvation, and some of you might know this, some of you probably heard this before, and to some of you this might be very new. Salvation isn't in one tense, let's just say it that way. Salvation is in three tenths. And let me explain that. You, if you are a child of God, you have been persuaded by the gospel, the word of the truth of the gospel, you have been saved. That is past. You have been saved. We call this justification. Just as if you have never sinned. That's what justification means. It's just as if you had never sinned. That is the past tense of you being saved. You are saved in the past from the penalty of sin. And we call it justification. And now in the presence, we would say we are being saved from the power of sin. Every Christian is a conqueror. You have victory. You can overcome. And we've seen this as we've been going through the book of Romans. We call this sanctification. Past tense is justification. Present tense is sanctification. Past tense is being separated, saved from the penalty of sin. Present tense, sanctification, is being saved from the power of sin. Past tense, justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Past tense, justification declares us righteous. Sanctification makes the sinner righteous. We have to understand this, that when you were saved in the past, you were saved from the penalty of sin. But now in the present, you are saved from the power of sin. But I want to focus more on the final salvation part, and that is that you will be saved. You have been saved, you are being saved, and now there will be a time where you will be saved from the presence of sin. And we call this glorification. Past tense, justification. Present tense, sanctification. Future tense, glorification. And that is that you are separated, saved from the presence of sin. This will be key to be a Bible student. This will be key for us to understand the scripture. Like I said, I want to focus more on glorification this morning. Now, God even created, God even created the creature. Not just you and I, but even the lion. You know, you see a a picture of a lion, you see a video of a lion attacking a zebra or whatever you do, or you see a zebra, you see your dog. God even created that creature for glorification. And you'll see that as we continue in our text here. Now, in verse 19 of Romans... Let's first jump to uh, Romans 18. He says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we covered this last uh, time that I preached on the book of Romans, that if you have to compare, and we use the dust mites, they're such a small creature that you cannot even see. You have to use a magnifying glass to even see a dust mite. If we would put it into this room, it would not even be comparable to this building. Now, if you took that dust mite, you have to use a magnifying glass, like these things are so small, and you put it outside in the world, it is not even comparable to the whole world. Neither is the suffering that we experience here in this earth comparing it to the glory which shall be revealed. Amen? Verse 19 says this, for the earnest expectation of the creature, this earnest, there's an earnest expectation of the creature, waiteth for the manifestations of the sons of God. Now even this creature is waiting for the manifestations, meaning for the Christian to be glorified. There is coming a time, there is coming a day where the Christian will be changed in his body. Let's just take a few verses. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I won't spend too much time on the rapture, but I do want you to understand there is coming a day where this will happen. We are Bible believers. We believe in every single word of it. We do not believe it's going to change. We believe it's true. Amen? 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, you'll find there in verse 50. Verse 50, the Bible says this, now this say I, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of, of, of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery, which we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now this sleeping is often talking, referring to a Christian that dies. When a Christian that dies, we call it sleeping because he'll be resurrected again. We will not taste the second death. So he says that we will not all sleep. So there are going to be certain people that will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the de dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now I do believe that that trumpet is Christ, just like in Revelation chapter 4, when we see that the third heaven opens and Christ calls up his sheep. He blows the trumpet. Matthew tells us that the sheep hear his voice. So I do believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I do believe that when the trumpet will sound, it will only be to the sheep. It will only be to his children, and they will hear his voice when he calls them up. So there's a time that this will appear, that time that this will happen, and we call this the rapture. He says, raise incorruptible, for this corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must be put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruptible, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall it be brought to pass the saying that it is written, death is swallowed up. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Think about this, guys. We are in a time where, 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 where we are waiting for this glorification. And not only we are waiting, but the creature itself is waiting for this. The creature itself won't experience the regeneration until the second coming, the second advent. But we are the, we'll read that later, we are the first fruit of this. But even the creature, even your dog, even your cat, all these things have an earnest expectation. They have an earnest expectation where they're waiting for this manifestation, this glorification of the sons of God. Where you will be revealed, where your body will be changed from, from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal. That your body will be changed and the, and the creature itself is waiting for this to happen, for this to be. Verse uh, 20 says this in Romans. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Now, this lion, this zebra, this dog, this cat was made subject to vanity, not because it chose to, not it, did, it didn't do it willingly. It didn't say, look, I'm going to go against God. It didn't do these things. It was eating grass. The lion wasn't attacking the zebra. It was eating grass. But he says, because of men's sin, these, pe th these creatures tar put, took part of this vanity. This vanity is saying these things are death, sickness, corruption. They took part of this Adam, after Adam's sin. Now you look at this world just for a moment. You look at the corruption of this world. Nothing stays good. Take your vehicle, for instance. Drive it around without doing any maintenance to it. It's not going to last. Go plant a garden. Do nothing to it. The weeds will overtake. It will grow so high that the sun can't hit the, the, the other, your fruits or your vegetables, and it will die. You know, I mean, sure, there is vegetables and fruits that, that go on, but see how everything takes maintenance. See, when God created the universe, when God created man, when God created these creatures, it was very good. Man, you looked at it and you're like, man, those people had, were very blessed, man. They, everything grew. Adam was just in charge of taking care of, of these things, but he didn't have to pick weeds. He didn't have to do these things. He could go pet the lion. But then when he sinned, that all, even the creature, even the creation, even the tree, even trees took part of this vanity. They die now. It all took part of that vanity. But I want you to catch this. Very interesting here. Looking at yourself, you know that eventually you're going to die. 
Death rate, 100%. Save one man, Enoch. I believe Elijah is going to die. He's going to be one of the witnesses, but we're not going to get into that. But think about the death toll. Now think about this. You even know that, just like the creature, you all took part of this. That one day you'll get old and your bones will start cracking. Your head's going to start hurting. You're going to walk and you're like, man, my back is killing me. And you'll go on and on and on. And all of a sudden, they'll put you in a coffin. They'll bury you. This is all vanity. You've taken part of this. The creature's taken part of this. And then he says this in the Ecclesiastes. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 8. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. Listen to that. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. No discharge from this man's army. You know, there are people today, and we see this, we see these people, they try so hard, let's make this world better so people don't die anymore. Let's make this world so good that plants and creatures and everything, let's not, let's, that they don't get distinct here. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying be slacking, throw stuff out, or all that stuff. But what I'm saying here is people put so much emphasis on changing the world. Well, let me tell you this. The world will one day burn. It needs to be changed by somebody else. Something needs to be changed, and it's not a pastor. It's not a farmer. It's not a, a person that deals with all this green stuff. These are the people that are not going to change. It'll have to be when Jesus, the captain of our salvation, brings many sons unto glory. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says this, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became, for whom all are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. It'll have to be when the owner shows up. Romans, uh, Psalms chapter uh, 24. Psalms chapter 24. He says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hills of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? You know who's going to do the changing? The captain of our salvation, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? You know, when the king shows up, it will change a little bit. Back to our passage here in Romans. This vanity will change. Because listen to what he says. He says, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but listen to this next, next, next part here. But by reason, listen to that, but by reason of him. Who is him who hath subject the same in hope? You know, today many people say, I wish I could go back to the time where Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know why I don't want to go back to the time just like Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden? Because who's going to corrupt it next? Who's going to be the next person that's going to sin? He says there's actually a way better hope. That same, that same person, the part when, that this creature was made subject to vanity, now God is going to make the him subject to a hope, to a future hope. And I want you guys to see the beauty of this. I want you to see the plan, the purpose, the, the, the sovereignty of God in this, of who God is, how God has, has, has planned these things. He says, look, he knew that creature was going to fall and become that vanity. But he already had a purpose. He had a purpose for a hope. For a reason. Verse 8, chap, verse eight 21 says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into a glorious liberty of the children of God. Of this corruption where the creature goes out in the forest, all of a sudden there's a forest fire. Man, the cruelty that sometimes you see and you almost feel bad for these animals when they get eaten by a, a lion or a, a, a tiger or something, you're like, wow, that actually would suck. 
See, these creatures are groaning and travailing and waiting with earnest expectation for this to pass. And it happens when the sons of God, you and I as children of God, are glorified. When our salvation, our future being saved is finished. When the king shows up in Psalm, I mean Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Jump there in verse, I think it's verse 6. Listen to this, guys. This will happen. This is what he was talking about. When these creatures are, when they were made subject to vanity, but they will be made subject to hope. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. The wolf. You know, you now you look at a wolf, you're like, man, don't kids, don't get close to that thing. It's going to eat your cows. But the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the faddling together. And the little children shall lead them. Now, can you visualize this a little bit, how that's going to look? This is what he's talking about when he says that these will be made subject to hope when they're having earnest expectation of this to appear. Verse 7, And the cow and the bear shall feed, and the young one shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. Vegetarians. Verse 8, And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. Can you imagine that your kid playing with a rattlesnake, a big anaconda? That's creepy. Your kid sitting on the big anaconda and riding along with it? See, the, the, the creature, even the creature itself, has an earnest expectation of these things to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Of the bondage of corruption. Now back to our passage here in Romans. But until then, the whole creation, verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Until that time, the whole creation is travailing and groaning. Just like a woman does when she's giving birth to a child. Travailing and groaning earnest expectation of that child to be born. Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also. Now can you imagine this? This world being like a bride. This world being like a bride. And man, sure, it's beautiful. You look at the mountains... You drive by and you're like, wow, thank you, Lord, for giving us the scenery. And you know, I think it's in the Genesis where God made the river with the gold. It says so people could look upon it. See, God created things for you to look upon. He gave you things that, man, it's like, man, that's beautiful. But can you imagine the whole creation as a bride waiting for its groom to, to come and deliver it? Eagerly waiting for this expectation. Now, you know, you get caught up in, in landslides and, and mudslides and you get caught up in volcanoes, caught up in avalanches, caught up in earthquakes, caught up in famines. But the whole creation as a bride waiting, waiting with earnest expectation for its groom to come and get it. Beautiful and glorious will that day be. Amen. Now, imagine when that groom shows up. You know, it's interesting in Amos chapter 9, verse 13. Amos chapter 9, verse 13. It says, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth the seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and it shall the hell shall melt, and all the hills shall melt. Think about this. The plowman, the, the treader won't even keep up with the plowman. You know, you look at it now, the plowman has to work hard so that the reaper can even have something to pick. That the person can even have enough grapes and stuff to pick. But he says, there's coming a day where the plowman's barely going to do anything and there'll be plenty, plenty, plenty. 
Even the trees are groaning and travailing and waiting for that moment, for that time. Verse 23 says, and Romans 8, 23 says, and not only they. See, this is how you know it wasn't us. This because listen to this. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, we are the first fruit of the Spirit. It's like we're the first fruit. We're going to be the first one that when we get raptured, that Christ will deliver us. The other ones will only experience the regeneration, the creatures at the second advent, when the millennial starts. But we will receive that before the seven-year tribulation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice... Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Think of this just for a moment, guys. We talked about being justified. When you got saved, you were justified. Just as if you had never sinned. You were saved. Now we are walking from justification to glorification. You guys remember the story of of, uh, the Israelites? Let's just use this as a scenario. He says that that whole story happened for us as an example. For an example. They came to Egypt. Why did they get to Egypt? Because they sinned. It was a punishment for them. They were enslaved. When God delivered them with the blood of a lamb that they were now brought into the wilderness. Now just think of this. Let's just use that as an example as justification. You were set free. God set the Israelites free from Egyptian, from the Egyptians. And then you walked into the wilderness. And we call this sanctification. God says, look, you will get to a land, Canaan, glorification. But it will be hard. You will have to suffer. But remember that the suffering of this present time isn't even worthy to be compared to what you'll find in Canaan. I delivered you from Egypt. I delivered you from the penalty of sin, justification. Now we are walking in sanctification in that wilderness and travailing and groaning for Canaan, longing to be in Canaan. He says, now wait patiently and walk. You know, we will one day end up, and we call this the judgment seat of Christ. It is not the great white throne of judgment. It is not the judgment of the nations. Well, you'll find in Matthew where it says, I was hungry and you did not feed. That's the judgment of the nations. And I'm sure we'll somewhere get those messages in here yet. But there will become a time that you'll end up at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting in verse 13. Or let's go verse 11. He says, for other the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build up on this foundation, gold, listen to these words, gold, silver, and precious stone. Three. The next three, listen to the next three. Wood, hay. Now I lost my... Wood, hay, and stubble. Now, three other things. Which three of these are going to burn? Wood, hay, and stubble. Gold, silver, and precious stone does not burn. Now, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Every man's work. If you're saved in here, your works will be made known. I truly believe it will be made known to everybody. 
When you get to the judgment seat of Christ, if you guys remember the story of Revelations, where they become before the great, the, not the great white throne of judgment, but they become, when they get raptured, when he's at the throne and there's crowns and the elders and these people are throwing their crowns down, this is, this is that time. He says, look, now you are before the ju- Jesus as a saved person, and he's going to judge your works. He says, some people, you're going to have gold, silver, and precious stone, and some of you are going to have wood, hay, and stubble. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Now, what's going to happen to your works that's going to be revealed by fire? That's hay, stubble, and wood. It will burn. You're going to get rewarded for those works. And I'm not in any way saying that this is a way to get saved. I'm saying when you're already in the wilderness, if you're still in Egypt, the only thing you have left for you is eternal punishment in hell. The only thing, if you're still in Egypt, is that you have eternal punishment in hell. But when you are persuaded by the gospel, the word of the truth of the gospel, you are saved, and then you're in the wilderness. And then you, when you die, or when, when the rapture happens, you will be before this throne, and he will look at your works. You won't be able to hide any of the work. The works will be revealed. And he says, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now think about it. Let's just say you have six good works, but some of the works are vanity. Some of those works will just burn. And you'll come there and you'll be like, whoa, I didn't get rewards. I always imagine this. When you end up at the judgment seat of Christ, you see a lot of crowns and you even see some of your names on these crowns. You're like, hey, Jesus, is that my crown? He says it was. It was supposed to be your crown. But you were pretty lazy when you were here on earth. You know, God didn't save you to be lazy. God saved you so you would work. You don't work to get saved, but you work when you are saved. So God saved you for that. God says, like, okay, now put it this way, guys. The reason I'm bringing this up is because right now we are between justification and glorification. We are between Egypt and Canaan. We are in the wilderness. We have been set free. Somebody's like, but that doesn't feel like freedom. It is freedom. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. We've been saved from those Egyptians killing us. And guess what the wilderness declares to us, shows us? That if we have power over sins because the sin just drowns in the river. Do you guys get what I'm saying? When these people try to destroy the the, the Israelites, guess what God did? God says, now you have power over sin and I'm going to drown them. You are in the wilderness on your way to Canaan. And there will come a day, guys, we are running a race. Paul says this. We're running a race. We're looking for rewards. And this is exactly sanctification by doing right. You know, people say, do you have your own righteousness? Righteousness means right doing. You don't get saved by right doing. But when you are saved, you're supposed to be right doing. Amen? So think about it. We are sanctified. We are being sanctified as we walk in the wilderness on our way to Canaan from Egypt. We look back and we praise the Lord Jesus Christ for saving us out of Egypt. And as we are walking towards Canaan, glorification. That's what I'm saying. That when you look at salvation, it's in three tenths. You have been saved from Egypt. You are being saved from creatures, from the Israelites, from hunger in the, in, in the wilderness. And you will be saved when you end up in Canaan. So there's rewards. There's rewards for, for preaching the gospel. I'm not, I didn't go through all these, these verses, but I have tons of verses on this. I've t- taught this before. There's rewards that you receive. Think about it at the moment you are right now, guys. We should want rewards from Christ. It's going to be worth it. God says, look, I'm going, I gave you salvation. I gave you eternal life, but I want you to receive some rewards because I want you to work for me. Just like a child, when you encourage, hey, you know what, kids, if you do that really quick, I'll give you a hundred dollar bonus. Or if you do that really quick, I'll do that. Think about it. We all do that. We all want that. So God uses that same method. Think about it. We all work a little bit harder when it says, look, if you guys do this, I'm going to get, we all work a little bit harder. Not to get saved, but after we are saved, we work a little harder. He says, you're my child, and look, I want to reward you guys, so I'm going to give you some things. Now do it. And as children, we quickly do it. I tell my kids this sometimes, clean your room this quickly and you'll get something. Man, they can work fast. 
or do this or do that, right? And then that's exactly what God does to his children. He says, do it a little quicker. Hey guys, go bring some, bring, bring the gospel out. There's rewards waiting for that. So you'll, you'll find that as in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, if, and if any man's work abide, which he hath built upon, he shall receive a reward. So if those are works, stone, precious stone, silver and gold, those are works when they, you put them on a fire. Just imagine this. You coming there with bags of works. Oh yeah, I think I'm going to get some rewards. You come and bring it there and you set it down and then he puts it on fire to try it to see if they're good works. He sets it on fire and it all burns and you got a little one little piece of silver left that didn't burn. He picks it up. But you came there thinking, and a lot of people do this. This is what religion even brings as well. This is what people think. They bring a big load. They think, man, I do so many good works, I'm going to get rewarded. But they're all vanity. These, some of these works are vanity. They did this to be seen. They did this to earn. They did this not for the reason God had intended them to do it. Going back to our text here in the book of uh, Romans. Or actually, let's, one more, let's just stay in Corinthians. I just want to read this one verse here, just so you, you, you get this. 315. Watch what he says. And if any man's work shall be burned. Do you see that, guys? Listen to this very carefully. If, any, if you guys had bad works, if you guys did terrible things, and your work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Man, you have nothing now. You have no crowns. You have none of these things left. But he him shall, listen to this, shall be saved. Yet so by fire. You know what that means? That fire... Even though that fire burnt your works, you were saved still. Even though that it seemed like, man, this was all lost, you were still saved. It's not like now you're like, well, now my soul is going to go to hell too. No. He says, that's how I just tested your works. This is at the judgment seat of Christ. And you only earn these rewards in the wilderness on your way to Canaan after Egypt. Verse 24, Romans, let's go back to Romans, our text there. Verse 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Just remember this, even in 1 Peter, I think that's the 1 Peter, adoption and redemption come together. Because adoption always costs something. When you adopt someone, it costs you money. Now, this is where the devil gets real mad. That it cost the most, Christ paid the most highest price for you that anybody could. When Christ adopted you, now just, just think about this a little bit. If you, you had two people bidding, I'm not saying that the devil was bidding on your soul. I'm just using this as an example. Let's just say you had two people bidding on a house. And this guy's like, I really want that house. The devil's like, I really want that person. I really somehow want to deceive him yet and, and bring him into hell with me. And then here comes Jesus. And he says, what's the highest number? Frank, what's the highest number you can think about? The highest number out there, and he says, this is what I offer. And God looks at it and he says, I accept. We call that propitiation. Redemption is Jesus making the payment. Propitiation is God being pleased and accepting that payment. Hey, I want that child. I want Abe Hebert to be my child. Here's my blood. The precious blood of the Lamb. Now think about how, what, he, what it cost. What did it cost Jesus to adopt you as a child? His blood. As I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Thinking about this cost. 
Now, now, you know, a lot of people like to disbelieve this. That's why you see the blood becoming very vain or very shallow in a lot of new translations, new messages. People don't like to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you this. There is no other way but by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing shall wash away my sins but the blood of Jesus Christ. Now think about that precious payment that was made. When he says, I want that to be my child, I will redeem him. These are legal terms, to wit. In other words, to redeem his body. See, Christ, again, let's look at salvation. I have saved them from the penalty of sin. I will save them from the power of sin. And now I will save them from the presence of sin. And that is when you are in Canaan, when you are glorified, the glorification of the Son of Man, where all these creatures have been groaning and travailing for this time. Next verse says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is not seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Now think of this just for a moment. Hope is something that you do not see. Do you know why 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says love, faith, and charity? These, three, these are three of the greatest things, but charity is better. I'm just paraphrasing here. You know why he says that? Because faith and hope are going to end. Because hope is only things you cannot see. You were imprisoned. You did not know where to turn. You were chained. Lost. You have no hope. All you seen was the chains around your arms. Trying to move your hands and trying to move away, but you're chained to the wall. This is exactly, if you're lost in here, exactly who you still are. You're chained to the wall. You have no victory. You have no power. You have no hope. You have nothing, but you have a destination called eternal punishment in hell. And here you are chained to a wall. No hope. And Jesus comes, and he sneaks into the window as a thief in a night, and we call this circumcision, a dwelling place, or your body, a circumcision made without hands, and he starts cutting your flesh away from your soul and your spirit, and he starts ripping those chains apart. And those chains apart. And he says, you're free. And then he walks out the, back out the window and he's like, hey, I want to come with you. He's like, not yet. You got to get to Canaan first. There's, you still have to wait. I'll come and get you. But while you're here, look what the book of Philippians says in Philippians chapter what is that Philippians verse? You want to put it there, Frank? I think I only have one. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's, I'm not leaving you hanging here. I'll hand you stuff through the window. But you have to wait. And then he leaves. That's hope. That's hope that you're waiting for the time that Jesus Christ will deliver you from out of that dwelling place. That is the final salvation. That is the complete of salvation. Isn't it amazing to just think that you have that hope? Imagine before that you had, didn't have that hope. You were sitting in that prison. You could not even move. You were chained. You couldn't do nothing. But he circumcised. He broke those chains. And he says, just, just wait a moment. You just wait a moment. You're still in the wilderness. But if we have hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? So what are we doing right now? No, he's coming. Somebody says, no, he's not. You guys are crazy. Man, people have said that for thousands of years. People have said that for so long. You're crazy. That's not true. Oh, yeah. That's patience. I'm waiting. Now, let's read a verse here. 
John chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go prepare a place for you, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Is, that, is Jesus a liar here? Is Jesus lying right there? No, he's not. How, much of you, how many of you believe that Jesus is going to come and get you? He's going to come and get you. Jesus says, look, I'm going to prepare a place. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I'm leaving, I will come back and I will get you. It doesn't matter how hard these things are. It doesn't matter how much you travail and groan. It doesn't matter the pain and the suffering. Let's say this. It will not compare to the glory that shall be revealed when the sons of men shall be manifested. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Now isn't that interesting? Here as Christians, see we have infirmities. People have heartaches. People have stomach aches, back aches. People have their death. They can barely hear. They can barely see. And sometimes all you think about is praying for those things. See, we've talked about prayer. It's like sometimes all we think about is praying for those things. And sometimes we do. Sometimes we go down and we kneel and we say, Lord, heal me. I'm going to use an example here. Imagine going into a, a doctor's office. And you're walking in, you're doing this. You're, walk, you're walking in, you're doing this. Hey, look, guys, I broke my, I broke my leg. Oh, hey, nurse, look, my leg is broken. And your arm is like twisted up and all this stuff. And you're walking in, you're like, look, my leg is broken. The nurse looks at you. And he goes to the doctor and he says, yeah, his hand is broken. Hey, that's not what I said. Uh, my leg is broken. See, in our affirmities, that's what we look at. We look at things we don't even know sometimes what we need. Watch what he says here in just Ecclesiastes. There was another Ecclesiastes verse I had there, right? Frank, or? Seeing there be many things that increase. Okay, another one. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was six tw uh, Ecclesiastes 6.12. Ecclesiastes 6.12. For who knoweth what, a, what is good for man in his, this life? All the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? So who can tell what's good for a man? See, think, that's what I'm saying. When we think spiritually, that's exactly what we think. We think there in the spirits, like, no, I'll intercede for him. But the, guys, this is a beautiful picture. I want you to, to, to just think of this, how beautiful this picture actually is when we go and pray. Man, we're in this thing, and we're like, God, I don't know. You start praying. And then we have a spirit that intercedes for us. And he says, no, I'm going to bring that prayer. So what does God hear? The thing that the Spirit tells God. He says he knows the heart and searches the heart of the Spirit. And that's what comes before God. And guess what he says next? Verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of of God. You might be praying for something sometimes. You might say, why is God not answering my prayer? He is. He just didn't heard your prayer in your affirmities. He, the Spirit brought him a different word. The Spirit brought him something else that you thought you didn't need, but you needed more than the things that you prayed for. Think about this. God answers your prayer. The, the, he says, according to the will of God. He maketh intercession. So people say, should we stay quit, completely stop praying? No, because sometimes not even God's will is, ends up in your life because you don't pray for it. God wants you to pray for it. God wants you to pray for something. God wants you to come there. Even if you come there with travailing and groaning, you don't know what you're saying, but God's like, I know exactly what he needs. He's asking me now, I'll give it to him. And he might think, man, my prayer hasn't been answered. He says, oh, yes, it has been. You just don't know it. 
your, leg, your, your legs are perfectly fine. I just healed your arm. And you're still walking around thinking that your legs are, 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 are broken. Your leg was never broken. It was your arm, and he healed it. But you're still walking around thinking, yeah, guys, I broke my leg. I can't walk. Think about it. Sometimes we bring something to God. We pray. We bring something to God. The Spirit takes it, intercedes on our behalf, and brings it before the throne of grace where God is and says, look, this is what he wants and he needs and he longs for. And it's completely according to your will. So we need to pray, even though sometimes we don't know what to pray. But the Spirit intercedes. Isn't that comforting, guys? Isn't it comforting that, that the Spirit intercedes for us. I think I'm going to close it there. I'm not going to get, I thought I was going to get through it, but probably get pretty warm. Amen.